Hey guys, here are some little practice problems for test three or, or you know, kind of some things that you might uh, see. Let's uh, get started here and I'll try to rip through these as quick as possible. If you have any questions, just send them to me, of course. Uh, right here, we're looking for the mass, trying to find mass. Uh, this little hummingbird is flying along. Meters per second would be the velocity and uh, we're told that the kinetic energy is 0.9. Now, if it helps, helps you to make a list, you could do that. Uh, but of course, like always, um, we're trying to find a formula that involves all the variables that we have. And of course, uh, if we think about the definition of kinetic energy, one half mv squared, then we'll see that this works really nicely. I've got the kinetic energy. I've got the velocity. I'm looking for the mass. So I need to solve that. We'll multiply by 2 and divide by v squared. Oops, sorry, 2 goes up here, and there's my v squared like that, and we can just put the numbers in. No big deal. Uh, this is actually the correct number for this thing, which fascinates me to no end. Um, I went and looked up the mass of a hummingbird and kind of built this problem backwards. But check this out right here. Um, if you come in here and say 2 times 0 0.9 uh, divided by 15 squared, uh, 8 grams. Okay, 0 0.008 kilograms, or 8 grams. That's crazy. Okay, uh, here we've got a hammer that's getting thrown down toward the ground. Uh, if the picture helps you, that's fine. But what I need you to realize is that the hammer starts out up here, and then the hammer is down here. Okay, and there's the ground. So we're talking about that instant just before it hits the ground. And you see how there's 0.1 and 0.2? A central idea on this test, on this set of material, is that the energy at point 0.1 has got to be equal to the energy at point 0.2. I'm not going to get any magic energy from here to there. I'm not going to lose any. It's all got to be there. It just changes form. So uh, this is a perfect place to put in conservation of energy. And in general, if you see one object at two points, then that's the direction you want to head. If the hammer is at the top and the bottom, if the roller coaster card, if the arrow gets shot from the ground up in the air and it's here and then it's there, one object at two points, you need to write down conservation of energy. Nine times out of ten, that's going to be mgh1 plus one half mv1 squared. That would be the potential plus the kinetic at the top. And then that's going to be equal to the potential plus the kinetic at the bottom. And um, notice that I've got a mass here, 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 and here. It's in every term, so I can strike that out. Effectively, I am factoring that out front and then dividing by m on one side, and it cancels on both sides. Okay, um, let's see what we know here. I've got a height of 22 meters, so that would be h1. Uh, the velocity up there at the top is 3 meters per second. Uh, at the instant that it hits the ground, h2 would be 0. I'm looking for the velocity. So I've got 3 out of the 4 variables in this thing right here. And since I'm looking for this guy, I need to solve it for v2. I'm going to subtract this term from both sides. And the order is not really important here, but I'm going to put it next to that other one. So I'd have something that looks like that. I need to get rid of the one half. So let's multiply both sides by two. And you can either park it out front like I'm doing here, or if you want to distribute it through, uh, that's another nice, nice option. Um, the nice thing about distributing it would be that it would cancel that fraction. But I'm going to leave it like this, and you do whatever you want with it. Uh, I need to take the square root of both sides to get rid of this squared next. So here's all of this stuff in here. That's where you want to put those numbers in. We've got the numbers. You can see the numbers. Why don't you do that on your own if you want to get the number for that. All right. Uh, here is a truck that's lifted straight up. 
So uh, I'm going to draw the ground. I'm going to draw a truck. And um, then it says that the mass of this thing is 4,000 kilograms. And we're going to pick this thing up. Uh, it's going to take a bunch of work to do that. Now, remember that work is force times distance. So when they tell me that the work is 1,530,000 joules, um, I can come through and say, well, I know that work equals force times distance. There's that upward force that I'm putting on it. And it's going to move some distance like that. And... Uh, they tell me that the distance is 15 meters, so I've got the work and I've got the distance. I could find the force that I'm putting on this truck, except here, um, what they're asking for is G. Go solve for G, and maybe G turns out to be 9.8 meters per second squared, therefore this happens on Earth. Maybe it's 3.7, so we're on Mars. Jupiter has a much stronger gravitational field, so uh, you'd have a bigger number there. Uh, what I would suggest is to remember that gravity is pulling down mg, mg here being whatever planet we happen to be on. Let me put a little g sub p just so that you don't think that's 9.8 automatically there. And um, this force has got to cancel that out. So I can come in here and replace the... lost my pencil. There we go. Uh, the work equals mg times x. You could leave it x. You could change it to a height if you want. Uh, that's another interesting thing because when I do work it gets stored as potential energy so you could come at it that way. But I want to solve this thing for g and again maybe g sub p or something else to say this isn't we're not necessarily on earth here. Uh, work divided by the mass divided by the height would give me uh, that value. So here we had uh, 1,530,000. guess we'll run some numbers on this one. Uh, the mass was 4,000 kilograms. H is 15 meters. And that's going to be the, uh, the acceleration due to gravity on whatever planet we're on. And then we can decide which one it is. 1530000 zero, 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 uh, divided by 4,000. Also divided by 15 would be... Uh, evidently, I got an extra zero in here. Okay, so should be 25.5 and that would be Jupiter okay so uh, evidently we're standing on Jupiter which is kind of an interesting idea because there is nothing to stand on and Jupiter is a big ball of gas like the Sun so I don't know what we're gonna stand on much less put a truck on but that's a different problem here's number four roller coaster leaves the top of the first hill uh, I've already got this picture going in my head. I hope you do too. I'm going to put it right here. And uh, so here's my roller coaster car right there. And uh, it's 18 meters up. So that's my height at point 0.1. It's moving 2 meters per second up there. So here's point 0.1. Find the height above the ground where it's moving 15 meters per second. As I roll down the hill, I'm losing height. I'm losing potential energy, but I'm converting it into kinetic energy. And at some point here, at some height, I'm going to be moving 15 meters per second, if the hill's tall enough. We'll find out here, right? Okay, but you see the one object at two points, conservation of energy. And so I dash out with my conservation of energy formula. I can cancel out all the M's here because it's in every term. It's always nice to get rid of stuff like that. Um, we're looking for the height. So that would be this guy. I'll subtract that last term from both sides. And of course I would need to divide by G. Uh, presumably we're back on Earth here. We left Jupiter behind. So uh, we'll just go back to our regular 9.8. Okay. 
Uh, there are some other things you could do. You could multiply through by two top and bottom and get rid of those one halves. You could, you know, kind of play with that if you want. But this is fine right here. Uh, you've got all those numbers. Stick them in there and see what you get. All right. One object at two points. Conservation of energy. Right here, the engine of a car does 170 kilojoules. Be careful with this thing. Kilo means thousand, right? So um, that's the work. And I would go ahead and put that into regular old joules. Work equals 170,000 kilo, thousand joules. Um, we are changing the kinetic energy. And this is in bold because it's supposed to be a, a, uh, a big hint here. When I do work and it results in a change in kinetic energy, that's tied together with the work energy theorem. Okay? When I do work, it's got to go into something. It can either change the height of the object and therefore the potential energy, or it could change the velocity and therefore the kinetic energy. And this was one thing that we wrote down. Um, when I spell that thing out, work equals one half mv squared minus one half mv naught squared would be one notation for it. you. You can call it v2 and v1 if you want. I don't care. Okay? But I have those velocities. I've got v1, I've got v2. We're looking for the mass. So that's our job today. Go get the mass. Well, the mass is here and there. It's a common factor on the right. So if I pull that out front, then it would look like this. And I could divide by all this mess in the parentheses. And that would be equal to the mass. That's what we're looking for. All right. Um, let's go ahead and put the numbers in this one. At least get it into the calculator. See uh, what it looks like. Those one halves and all that could be a little bit tricky. So I'm going to put a, a line here. Uh, remember, I've got to do all of this before I divide W by it. So I'm going to put some parentheses around this just to make sure that happens right. Here's one half times, uh, I want the final velocity. That's 20 meters per second. And please don't forget to square that because it is v squared. And then I've got one half, uh, eight meters per second. That's also squared. And then I can close that thing up. And that should be the mass. Here's what it would look like on the calculator. I'd have uh, 170,000. That's the numerator. Divided by parentheses, 0.5 for the one half times 20 squared minus 0.5 times 8 squared. All right, that's one way to do it, not the only way. But uh, I've got about a thousand kilograms here, which kind of makes sense. That's about the mass of a car. That would, uh, that's a lightweight car. Okay, something like that. That'd be right at uh, 2,200 pounds, which, you know, a little uh, Honda Fit kind of thing maybe. Um, how far will a winch motor with a power? When you see the word power, there is only one thing to do. You need to come in here. Where's the pen? Where did it go? I lost my pen. Hang on. There, there we go. Little cursor gets lost. When you see the word power, uh, or horsepower, or uh, watts, or any kind of unit of power, uh, you need to go ahead and write down the power equation because you're going to use it somehow. Power is the rate of work. It's how fast you're doing work. Work divided by time. Right there. So that's uh, what we're doing. Now this has got some funny units in it. Uh, horsepower is not a metric unit. That is a imperial unit. That's a British unit, an American unit. So, But I have the conversion factor here. So the first thing I would do is to convert that to watts. And 3 times 746... Our favorite uh, number here would be 2,238 watts of power, okay? And, and that's what we'll use. That is P. We measure power in watts. And remember that a watt was a joule per second. A joule is a newton meter. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So I can chase all this stuff all the way back to... My, my regular metric units, we don't uh, particularly care for horsepower. A watt is a joule per second. 
a joule is a newton meter. I got that second on the bottom. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. I got that extra meter there. And there's a second downstairs like that. So we're in standard units now. And uh, you always want to make sure that you, you got that. I've got a time of 12 seconds. So, uh, you know, that's nice. I got this one. I got that one. Uh, right there, I could solve this thing for work. Might as well do that. That's uh, the power times the time. Power is how fast I'm doing work. You multiply that by the time, and you get how much work you did. So that's not too surprising. But right here, how far? I need distance, and this doesn't have distance yet. Um, it says that I've got a 160-kilogram crate. Maybe you want to come over here and draw a little picture. There's my crate sitting on the ground. I'm going to winch this thing up into the air. And uh, with some amount of force, it's going to move some distance. And remember, force times distance is work. So I could go ahead and make that replacement. Power times time equals force times distance. Work is force times distance. Just did that little sleight of hand right there. And furthermore, because I've got to overcome the, the gravity on this thing, that force has got to be equal to mg. So I can take that and put it in right here. The power times the time equals mg. Uh, you could change this to h if you wanted for height, and it would be the potential energy. When I do some work for a period of time, when I have when I use power for a period of time, that's going to be work. That's going to equal the potential energy. Leave it x, change it to h. I don't really care. Uh, but we're looking for that distance x or h, whichever one you go with. So the power times the time divided by mg. Uh, the power here is uh, the 2,238 watts. The time was 15, uh, 12 seconds. The mass is 160 kilograms. And g is 9.8 meter per second squared. And that will be the height, whatever it is. Number seven here, a uh, kilogram, uh, seven kilogram rocks thrown straight up at an initial velocity of 18 and a half meters per second. If energy is conserved, dang it, they tell us what to do there, right? How would you possibly miss that? Uh, if you had any question, you could draw it and say, oh, the rock was here, and then I throw it straight up. That's not very straight up, I guess, but uh, we'll pretend. And uh, you, you see a single object, the rock, at two points. And so I start thinking about conservation of energy. Even if they hadn't told me to do it, I would still say, well, I threw the rock and I was down here and then it went up there. Two places. Uh, let's get some numbers. H1, height at the bottom. I'm standing on the ground. It says that I throw it with 18 and a half meters per second. That didn't come out at all, did it? Hmm. And uh, how high does it go? H2 is what we're looking for. They don't tell me what the velocity is up there. Let's see. Let's think about that. This rock goes up, up, up. It's slowing down. Oh, it actually stops up there at the top. At the very peak of this thing, it comes to a complete stop. So I do have that number. They didn't explicitly tell me that. But the picture, you know, in common sense kind of helps me figure out what to do with that. One object at two points. You write down all this mess. Solve for the... Uh, the missing variable. Which would be this guy. And of course V2 being 0. That goes away. All I got to do is divide by M and G. And uh, it all cancels out. Of course I got an M here, here, and here. So that's all going to cancel out. You got your numbers. Put that in. See what you get. Number 8. Uh, 15 kilogram box is on an incline. Hmm, this is starting to look like uh, test two because that's where we did incline planes. Need a picture though. Uh, mass 15 kilograms. I got a 12 degree incline. Uh, there's a coefficient of friction. This looks a lot like test two. Wonder if I'm going to have to use uh, Newton's second law here. Find the work. Oh, wait. Work is force times distance. Uh, maybe I don't need it. Oh, but I don't know the force. I do need it. Okay, pull in all that old stuff that uh, if you need to. Uh, I'm going to push the, the thing uphill. So that's going to take some force. 
Uh, I guess that's the only force. Let's see, weren't there some other forces? Oh, I'm on a slope. I need a downhill pull. Oh, there's a coefficient of friction. I need a frictional uh, arrow here as well. So it looks to me like I'm going to have to do a Newton's second law to find the force, and then they want the work, and work equals force times distance. I've, uh, I've got the, the x. This is what I'm looking for. I don't have force, so I need to do something, namely Newton's second law. Find force, and then put that in right here to get uh, the whole thing. Well, let's go do Newton's law again. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. I see three arrows, F minus DHP minus F sub F. And that's equal to M times A. Ha! Huh. They told me that this is moving at constant velocity. So the acceleration equals zero. M times zero is zero, and I can just put a zero there. So the force is going to be equal to the downhill pull plus F sub F. Just add both of those to both sides and get F by itself. Of course, the downhill pull is mg sine theta. And you remember that the frictional force on a slope is mu mg cosine theta. And I've got the mass, and I've got g, and I've got theta, and I've got mu and mg and theta. So I can find the force, put your numbers in, see what you get. And then whatever that number is, bring it up here and multiply by 5 meters, and you'll have your amount of work on that one. Okay? Uh, if you want to hit pause right there and, and finish that up as you're working through these, that might not be a bad idea, but uh, whatever. Uh, right here, I've got a cyclist rolling down a hill. Let me get a picture going. i got to see this. Here is a, uh, a hill and a cyclist, something like that. And it's at the top, and she rolls to the bottom of the hill. Ha! Huh. One object at two points. I think I know where this one's going. One, two. All right, let's see what happens. Uh, the height of the hill is 12 meters. So H1 equals 12 meters, and they roll all the way to the bottom. So H2 would be zero. It says it starts at V equals two meters per second. That's the velocity at the top of the hill. And uh, we're moving at 15 meters per second at the bottom. Well, they gave me all the numbers. What do they want here? Uh, if the hill had a 20 degree slope, okay, theta equals 20 degrees. I don't know what we need that for, but let's find out. Find the frictional air resistance for slowing her down. Oh, that's new. That's different, but it's not that bad. Watch right here. What we can do is uh, draw in a little arrow on her. That's not an arrow. What just happened? Aye, aye, aye. Do that. I just wanted to draw a little red arrows. Isn't that hard, people? We got orange. How about that? Okay. There is a frictional force or an air resistance here that's slowing her down. So, you know, normally when I come along and do conservation of energy, I would have this right here. Only thing is, I've already got all of those numbers, so there's really nothing to solve for. Um, you could say, well, we don't know the mass, and normally that cancel. I do have the mass, actually. Uh, it's 100 kilograms, so I can't even cancel that out. If I put these numbers in here, this is not going to equal. Right now, uh, these two sides are not going to balance out. And the trick is that that air resistance slowed me down. I should be going faster than 15 meters per second. Let's say 20. I'm just making that number up. But maybe this number would have been 20, except the air resistance knocked it down to 15. So I lost some kinetic energy there. There's going to be more total energy at point one than there is at point two, and I need to make up for that. I need to calculate the work that the friction did slowing me down. Uh, remember when we do conservation of energy, we're trying to say the total energy at point one is equal to the total energy at point two, 
And at the top, I certainly have kinetic and potential energy. At the bottom, I certainly have kinetic. Uh, I'm at the bottom here, so actually the uh, potential energy is all gone. But there's some extra work that friction did slowing me down, and I've got to put that into the mix to, uh, to make this thing come out right. This is called a non-conservative force, and uh, I didn't make a big deal about this going through it, but uh, anytime something is uh, diverting some energy, stealing some energy, it's not destroying non-conservative, I can't even spell today, uh, anytime something is uh, diverting, stealing some energy, that's called a non-conservative force, uh, and the uh, air resistance or friction would certainly be a non-conservative force all right so um, this is one of those this would be measured in joules this would be measured in joules work is measured in joules all the units are okay here and um, turns out that now I can't cancel out that mass because I don't have it in the last term right it's got to be everywhere and it's not in the last term so don't go striking out all your M's on this one um, but uh, why don't we see if we can't uh, solve this thing for work? We already crossed out the potential energy, so all we got to do is move over the uh, kinetic at the bottom of the hill. Here's that. And I subtract this guy from both sides. And that's going to be equal to the work that friction did. Now, work is force times distance. So if I change this to force times distance like that, there's the guy that I want. That's what I'm trying to solve for. So if I divide through by x on both sides, then I'll have the force of friction that they want. Okay? So I get busy and I go one half. Mass is 100 kilograms. Uh, the velocity at the top was 2 meters per second. Don't forget the square. Plus 100 kilograms times g 9.8. Oh, I better write smaller here. Coming up fast. Uh, the height at the top was 12 meters. Not going to make it. Um, minus one half times 100 kilograms. Uh, at the bottom, I was going 15. That's got to be squared. Barely got it in. And then I'm dividing by the distance that this bike rolled. That distance is from right here to right there. It's not the vertical distance. The air resistance is working on that right there. Uh, that's the hypotenuse of this triangle. Here's the height and here's this. I need the hypotenuse and I don't have that. So I'm going to have to do a little thing here uh, with, a, with some right triangle trig to go get that number. This is one more twist on this one. If I draw a triangle And I'm looking for this, and this is 12, and there's a 20 degree angle right there. Uh, this would be the opposite of that side. This is the hypotenuse. So I could write that the sine of 20 degrees equals 12 over x. If I do a swappy thing here, x equals 12 over sine 20, and that would be my x. And... Uh, you can get that number, whatever. It's going to be a little bit bigger than 12. 12 divided by the sine of 20. Wouldn't hurt to make sure I'm in degrees here. I'm in degrees. Okay. And uh, that's going to be 35.1 or something like that. Okay. So that one's got that extra little twist. And we'll put that in there. I've got all my numbers here. I guess that's why I left that out. Huh. Let me uh, add your race on this thing. I forgot. No idea. Um, we'll just scribble this out right here. Uh -huh. That'll work. Put that 35.1 right there. And uh, whatever that turns out to be, turn the crank on that thing. Uh, here again, it wouldn't hurt to uh, come in with some some uh, parentheses, right? Or even a big bracket. We've got a bunch of mess going on. You want to make sure you get it all. Ah! <laughs> Crazy. Right there. Hold all that stuff on top together. And then divide it by 35.1. Nice. All right. 7 kilogram rifle fires a 0 .01 kilogram bullet 
at 430 meters per second. The first thing that I would like you to notice is that I have, this is the first problem we've done like this today, I have two objects. I've got object A and I've got object B. Okay, this is not one object at two points, this is two objects, and anytime I have two objects interacting, that's conservation of momentum. So this one kind of shifts here, moves over to the other chapter. I want to use conservation of momentum on this. Let's draw a little picture. Here is a crummy picture of a rifle, and initially uh, the bullet is, I don't know if it's going to let me put it inside there. I'm going to put it right here on top. It is right there at that. So the before picture would look like that. After I fire the gun, the bullets popped out the barrel, and it's zipping along this way, and the rifle actually has a recoil, a kick back, right? I don't know if you have any experience with these things or not, but the gun is going to kick backwards. Uh, why does it do that? Because it has to conserve momentum, all right? Uh, that's one way of expressing it. The other way, of course, would be that I've got burning gunpowder in the barrel here. That creates pressure was, as that gas heats and expands. That uh, expanding gas is going to push the bullet that way, but every action has equal and opposite reaction, so it pushes the gun back the other way. All right, But it will conserve momentum here, and that's where we want to go with this. So I know that P equals P prime. The momentum before I pull the trigger has got to be equal to the total momentum after I pull the trigger. And uh, you can get busy here and spell all that out. M1V1 plus M2V2 equals M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. All right. Can't cancel the masses because this is M1 and that's M2. I got two different masses in here. Uh, can't do much of anything. Let's go get some numbers and see what happens. They told me that the rifle M1 is 7 kilograms. They told me the bullet M2 is 0 0.01 kilograms. So I've got these numbers right there. Find the recoil velocity of the rifle. They want V1 prime. The, uh, the rifle is going to go that way. How fast? V2 prime, the speed of the bullet's going that way. We've got that number. That's 430 meters per second. But we don't have this one, so we're looking for that. All right. Uh, what about these two, V1 and V2? What is the velocity of the bullet before I pull the trigger? Oh, it's zero. What's the velocity of the rifle? It's zero also. So both of V1 and V2 cross out. That means I have no total momentum at the beginning of the problem. So that leaves me here. Uh, I'm looking for V1 prime, so I'm going to subtract this term from both sides. And then I'll divide through by M1. And I'd get that right there. And even see the negative sign there. What's that negative sign mean? Opposite direction. That's going to the left. All right. So if you take your 7... I'm sorry, 7 kilograms goes down here, 0 0.01 right there, and uh, 430 meters per second there. You'll get the recoil velocity of the rifle. Right here, i got a soccer player kicking a ball, and um, there again, there's the player's foot, there's a ball, there's two objects, and uh, so this is going to be another conservation of momentum, almost. Uh, it comes out of conservation of momentum. I'm going to draw the ball. Initially here, this is before he kicks it, and then we'll have a second picture after. Uh, conservation momentum problems, it's always good to have your two pictures. There's the ball, here's his foot, and uh, something like that. Let's see what numbers they give me. Uh, a force, huh, I wasn't expecting that. Force of 600 newtons. Is the force I put on the ball. I got the mass of the ball, 0.3 kilograms. It's originally tra traveling. Here's the part I was interested in. Let's get some velocities going on here. Um, 
the velocity is originally four meters per second to the left. I'm going to call that V1. No, it's just, uh, bup, 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 bup. Oh, no, I don't guess it matters. Um, V1, V2. Maybe we should call the foot object one and the ball object two. So this would be V2 uh, equals four meters per second. Down here, it ends up going 12 meters per second to the right. So that would be V2 prime, the velocity of object two, the ball, after the collision is 12 meters per second like that. Okay. They don't give us the velocity of the foot though like that. Here's the other kicker, time. Okay. I've got force and time involved in this thing. And uh, you may remember that there's a thing called the impulse momentum theorem. That's the easiest way to go after this one. It's not the only way. The impulse momentum theorem says that the impulse, force times time, is equal to the change of momentum. Like that. When I put a force on an object for a period of time, it's going to change its momentum. And uh, that's what we're seeing here with this. The change in momentum could be written uh, mv2 prime minus mv1, uh, 2, uh, like that. And maybe I should have just left the 2s off. We don't really need them because we're not thinking about the foot. We're thinking about the ball, but whatever. Um, we want to know the time. That's this guy. So if I divide through by force, right there, then I'll have that uh, number. Uh, the mass was 0.3 kilograms, uh, ends up going 12 meters per second, minus the mass is 0.3 kilograms. The velocity is 4 meters per second, except, whoa, whoa, whoa. This one's to the left, and that one's to the right. I need a coordinate system, don't I? This is my coordinate system. The direction of motion at the end is positive to the right. Let's call backward left negative. So this is actually negative 4 meters per second right there to indicate that opposite direction. 600 newtons on the bottom. And uh, that's going to be the time involved. And, of course, you want to make sure you do the whole top and all that, blah, blah, blah. But uh, that's what you need to do there. Right here I got uh, Fred is sliding on a sled, huh? Better get a picture going here. Sled. Fred. Okay. And uh, Motionless Joe is stepping on the sled with him, huh? Before... He steps on the sled. The sled's going this way, and he's going to pass this guy. And this freeloader is going to jump up on the sled. So here's object one, and here's object two, like that. And I even have some numbers here. Uh, V1 is equal to 8 meters per second. And that would be the sled and Fred, so mass one is 150 kilograms. And then over here, V2, how fast is Joe moving? Oh, he's motionless. That's not his nickname, Motionless Joe, because he never moves. It's, it's a description of his motion at the moment. Uh, and he is 80 kilograms right there. Now, after he steps up on the sled or falls on the sled or whatever, maybe, maybe Fred just runs into him and he falls on the sled. I don't know. But afterwards, we're going to have a setup something like this where Fred's still on the sled, but now Joe's on the sled too. And uh, so this is really a hit and stick. They're traveling together after the collision. So I could just model this as a hit and stick formula. You know, sometimes it's two train cars that run into each other and the coupling grabs hold, or maybe you. Maybe you shoot an arrow into a box on roller skates and it's moving or something after. If the two objects are traveling at the same speed afterwards, that's a hit and stick. And I've got a formula for that. A uh, hit and stick formula looks like this. Right there. 
and we could just put all the numbers in. 150 times 8 plus 80 times 0 divided by 150 plus 80. Ha! Huh, easy. Next, 13 1,500 kilogram car traveling north at 8 meters per second collides with a 4,000 kilogram truck moving east. Oh dear. North and east. Let's see what that would look like. I got a car that's moving north, and then there's a car, or a truck rather, moving east. That's a two-dimensional problem. So, uh, in a two-dimensional collision, uh, it's a collision. It's two objects that are interacting. So I'm certainly thinking about conservation of momentum. But, I got to do it twice. I got to make sure that uh, the momentum is conserved in the x direction, and then I'm going to come back and make sure that the momentum in the y direction is also conserved. This car, I guess this one's a truck, isn't it? And uh, it's moving uh, east. We've got some numbers, mass is 4,000 kilograms and the velocity is 15 meters per second. Here comes the car right here. got some numbers on that. Mass 2 is uh, 1,500 kilograms. The velocity is uh, 15 meters, no, 8 meters per second. Okay? So mine out all those numbers, get yourself a little picture, say, see what's happening. It says that they remain locked together after impact. So the truck comes this way, the car comes this way, they're going to hit. They get locked together. They, this is a hit and stick. And I just lost my pencil again. There it goes. Okay. And that pile of junk's going to go something off like that because the momentum of the truck's going to drive it east. The momentum of the car is going to drive it north. Uh, we're going to use this and get the east part, and this and get the north part, and then uh, we'll have to put those two together. We'll have those two components and see what we get. All right. Uh, because it's hit and stick, I get to use the hit and stick formula, and I'm just going to do that twice. So it looks like this, V prime equals M1 V1 plus M2 V2 over M1 plus M2 like that. But over here I'm just thinking about the x direction. So I want to only use the x components of the velocity. And when I do that, uh, I'd have 4,000 times 15 plus 1,500 times 0. I'm looking for the x components. Right? Uh, if I go to the trouble to break this out, v2x equals 0, v2y equals 8. And I could do that up here too. This is the x component. The y component, when I get over here to do this one, the y component of the truck is 0. So uh, be careful with that. This is going to go away. I'd have uh, 4,000 times 15 divided by 5,500. And that's 10.9. meters per second east. All right. Then I got to do the whole thing again. Come over here and say Vy prime equals uh, M1 V1Y plus M2 V2Y divided by M1 plus M2. And that's going to be 4,000 times the velocity of the truck in the y direction, there is none. 0 plus 1,500 times 8 divided by 5,500. That's going to give me a number. Uh, 1,500 times 8 divided by 5,500 is 2.2. .2. Something like that. All right. Now, we're not really done. 
Um, what we have done so far is to say that uh, we know this number right here is 10.9. This number right here is 2.18. But I need that number. This would be the, the velocity of the truck. So we need to do the Pythagorean theorem on this thing. And uh, that's going to give us some kind of number, uh, 11 or 12 or something. Square root 10.9 squared uh, plus 2.18 squared. 11.11.1, somewhere, I don't know, whatever. Okay. Um, but remember, velocity should have a direction associated with it. And they kind of do ask what direction. So I really need to come in here and say, well, if they're looking for this angle right here, you're going to get in there. That angle, this is going to be the opposite. This is going to be the adjacent. And I could do an arc tan on that thing where the opposite is 2.18 and the adjacent is 10.9. And I could get the direction of that thing. It would be about 11.3 degrees. Okay. So that's that. Uh, well, ah, here's the last one. All right. A uh, bowling ball is rolled into a second bowling ball. All right. You see the two objects? You're already thinking about conservation of momentum because I've got two objects. This would be mass 1 and V1. It's my before picture. I always like those two pictures for conservation of momentum before, after. Let's see what's happening here. I got a seven kilogram ball. It's moving at four meters per second. This is uh, mass two, 8.5 kilograms. V2, it says it's stationary. It's just sitting there. That's nice. This guy's moving. It's going to hit that ball. There's going to be a collision. Uh, I wonder what kind of collision that would be. Is that going to be a hit and stick? That would be an interesting game, wouldn't it? Bowling, you threw the uh, ball down the lane, rolled it, and uh, all the pins would stick to it. Hmm, maybe somebody should invent that. This isn't going to be a hit and stick. This is going to be a hit and bounce. Because bowling balls bounce off of each other. Sometimes you just have to kind of say, huh, I know what's going to happen. V1 prime, V2 prime. They want the speed of both balls after the collision. So that's where we're headed with this one. Um, I have two formulas. V1 prime is going to be M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 V1 plus 2M2 over M1 plus M2 V2. And so we'd get busy and we'd put those numbers in. I got 7 minus 8.5 over 7 plus 8.5 times 4 plus check this out right here life got a whole lot easier because they made v2 equals 0 0 times anything is 0 so this is just a 0 right there and uh, we could get the velocity of ball 1 right off the bat right here I'm going to put some parentheses around everything here just to make sure 7 minus 8.5 close up the numerator Go ahead and multiply by 4. You could wait on it. I don't care. Uh, divided by uh, parentheses 7 plus 8.5 is negative 0.39 meters per second. Um, that negative means that this ball is going to come in, hit that ball, and actually bounce backwards at 0.39 meters per second. Okay, and I'll put the negative there. All right, what's this ball going to do? Probably going to the right, isn't it? And it went to the right. Okay, but that would be V2 prime. I've got the other equation that tells me what's going to happen there. V2 prime equals uh, 2 M1 over M1 plus M2 V1 uh, minus M1 
minus m2 over m1 plus m2 all times v2. Now again, v2 is equal to 0, so this whole thing I don't have to worry about it. And if I come in here and say 2 times 7 divided by 7 plus 8.5, that's all multiplied by the velocity of the ball, 4 right there. So I'm going to get a 2 times 7 uh, times 4 divided by 15.5. Uh, that'd be a 3.6 meters per second. That is a positive number. So it's moving to the right. 3.6 meters per second. All right. So uh, those are some little sample problems. Hopefully that helps. If you have any question about any of that, of course, uh, you know how to get in touch with me. Please do it. And uh, hopefully test three will go great. Thanks. See ya.